Before we get started today, I wanted to talk to you about Sticker Mule. Now, Sticker Mule is a place where you can upload your artwork and get stickers and buttons and more printed with your logo on it. It's where I get my American Bandito stickers made. But right now, if you go to AmericanBandito.com slash Sticker Mule, click on the link, sign up for Sticker Mule, and you get $10 towards your first order. So go to AmericanBandito.com slash Sticker Mule and get $10 towards the stickers of your own logo or whatever you have. Shipping is also free, AmericanBandito.com slash Sticker Mule. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. One thing I think anyone can benefit from is learning from other people's mistakes. That whole concept of those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And of course, all of the shop owners this season should have some wisdom that they can pass along for those of us trying to make it in the world creatively. So this week, I asked the question, what mistakes do you wish you would have known when you started? Another way I could put this is, if you had a time machine and you could go back and tell yourself something, what would it be? That is after you're done messing with yourself because you just traveled back in time. I'd get that out of the way first and then I would tell myself what I could learn from. Sarah from 11000 had a pretty quick response to my what did she wish she knew question. I probably would have asked for more money. <laughs> okay. That is like the num one of the number one. Actually, I was only going to ask for like thirty thousand dollars, and they're like the number one biggest mistake that startups make is not asking for enough money. Especially women, they tend to not ask for as much money, and so I probably would have asked for more just to be a little bit safer. The thought of that really got creeps me out. But when you have a loan, you have a loan, mm -hmm. so it's not as big of a deal. And it's funny because when you talk numbers about startups, I'd be like, I need like $50,000. And people are like, that's not a big deal. I'm like, that's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. That's scary. And they're like, in the world of businesses, it's not really that big of a deal. So one of the other things to protect my time a little bit better and to really establish those patterns right in the beginning so that I not, wouldn't be at this point where now I don't know how to get out of not having my own life mm -hmm. outside of the business I think one thing that I did right in the beginning, which I think is important for anybody, is that I surrounded myself with people in the same situation. So when I quit my job, I specifically sought out other female entrepreneurs. We actually started our own work group together where we would get together once a week and just not work alone in our houses. We would work together at coffee shops. That's cool. um, and then we became our own support system. I think that's really, really important for anybody trying to start something because you're you're pretty much you're usually the renegade out of your friends and family. You have a lot of friends or family that might say, oh, "I just think you're making a bad decision." Oh, of course. Yeah, or they don't understand, or they're really scared for you, and that's not the kind of support. I mean, you need other types of you need support. Mm -hmm. So other people who are going to like really be people you can depend on their opinion. Cause like if they say it, if they know if they're in the same boat and they say like, Ooh, I don't know about that. You can really trust that it's not coming from a place of ignorance or fear. You yeah. Know? So I think that's a, um, a really important thing for anybody who's starting. Out. Laura from anthology says the big thing she learned was to make sure you have a structured plan for what you want to bring in. I think the big one was that the business grew fast on us. So that basically was why I was crying to the IRS on the phone. We didn't realize we had to structure things a certain way okay. so quickly. So I would just say if anyone was hoping to learn from our lesson that not winging it, you know, maybe talk to some tax professionals just a little bit. Okay. A lot of times the mistakes ended up leading to something positive. And so if I went back and advised myself not to make that mistake, then I, that would also undo what happened from it. So I feel like the small advice of consulting a tax person is like not going to mess up my future too much. So I feel like I could stick with going back with that small piece of advice. But there's other things. I mean, there, there were definitely times where I was like, Oh boy, we really made a mistake there. And then like a year later, it turned out 
Oh, that was high. As you were saying that, I was remembering something where it's like, oh, if I would have went back and stopped myself from this horrible thing that happened, I might not have went the direction I did today. Yeah, exactly. Like, hmm. I couldn't, if I took back that last year at my job, then this wouldn't have happened. Tammy of Bohemian Bobble says it's the opportunities that she missed for classes that could have taught her things she regrets. I wish I would have taken accounting when mm. I was in school <laughs> or taken accounting when I started running my own business. That would have helped a lot, I think. Yeah? You, you think The numbers have, make me so stressed. Do you think you would have still had the store if you did that? <laughs> I don't know. Probably. You know, no. I bet yeah. I would. But would you be better off if you... I the pop-up thing sounds kind of cool. Yeah, you know? I don't know. I don't know. But it's hard to say. I don't have to live it. I don't know. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I'd have to think on that a little bit. But that's the thing I, I find myself saying all the time is, oh my God, I wish I had taken an accounting class. Mm-hmm. Just because when tax time rolls around and your sales tax quarter or whatever, it's just stressful. Mm-hmm. I hate that stuff. Math is dumb. It is dumb. I'm not a fan. So dumb. Like with me, when I was in high school, I had a typing class that I never went to, but still got a C in it somehow. I didn't even know where the room was. (laughs) I was just like, I'm never going to use this. I'm going to be an animator. Yeah, now I do (laughs) websites for a living. (laughs) I had to learn the hard way. I wish that I would have had more confidence in myself even younger. I didn't even realize I was creative. Until that day with my friend, and she taught me how to make... I liked to write back then, so I felt like I was creative with words. But I didn't know that I was creative any other way. <laughs> so I wish I would have had more confidence to to try more things when I was younger on the creative side. That woman really opened up your eyes, She, huh? she completely did. If, if that, and all you were looking for was a cheap gift to give away for Christmas yeah, or something. Yeah, and she's still a really great friend of mine, too. So. Yeah. But I think about it all the time. If that had not happened, I don't know if I ever would have found the jewelry making. Wow. Leah and Rebecca from Booth 121 tell me they only have minor things that they would mention. But as they said this, it sounded to me like they were just so happy that it happened to them at all. Maybe taking on vendors that we shouldn't have... And I don't want to say that that wasn't good. It just didn't fit with us. That would be one. They've been pretty minor. They've been like, oh, yeah. shit, I should have added that to that contract. But, I mean, it was like and then minor stuff. Then yeah. we just add it to it and we're done. The thing is that after the whole leap of faith of moving into the building, we're big babies. We just kind of keep growing slowly. There's not a lot of huge leaps of faith. I think the one, the couple of things that would have gotten us had been... If we had taken a different location, probably. Mm -hmm. Or if we had, in fact, gone through with getting a loan. Mm -hmm. We'd be like, why do you do that? Because we just are kind of almost slow to react sometimes. I think it saved us a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that was not paying ourself and and keeping that humble, that humbleness about us that I don't think will ever change. I don't think we'll ever be pulling up in a BMW or anything like that. We're just not like that. We will always get paid less than we're worth, but that's just us. We'd rather maybe buy the building at some point. Nothing ever felt like I was forced to do it. And if it, if I felt like that, I didn't do it. That's how I felt anyways. Everything just kind of fell into place. It's, it's it, weird. it really, it really did. Wouldn't say I'd do it every, any differently, and I and I think if it would have came too easy, when, I wouldn't yeah. appreciate it so much, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't still have such a passion for it. Anastasia of Confectionique has learned that she needs to remember to stick to the plan. It continues to be a learning thing is is that if I ever get away from my mission and my goals for the shop, then in general the shop just does not do as well. It's really just best if I just stick with what I love, what I know the customers love, and what I know that they hope for each time they come, that's probably the most important thing. I don't mind dabbling in different things, but in general, for me and for this business, it's always been best for me to stick with going back to what my original vision is for the shop. It's to bring a touch of Paris here. It's just best that I stick with that. That's kind of the vision I've had all along, and so that's Good, best for me and my best fit. Don't, Being don't true, second guess what you're doing. Right. The other thing is I don't bring anything in here that I wouldn't have in my own house. I mean, I do look at things in market and think, oh, I know who's going to love this 
or I'll sometimes put a wish list out there. I'm going to Paris. What do you hope we find? You know, and they'll write down things that they hope. So I'll look for things for people. If I'm going to bring it in here. I've got to say, I love it too. It's just the best way to kind of pass that love along. You can have periods of real disappointment when you have a business. Well, I remember the early days as if we would get 40 customers for the entire market or something. And just how hard that was, thinking, this is the greatest idea. This is the cutest shop ever. Why aren't people coming in? And then I think just realizing that getting your name out there and growing a business really just takes time. And it's nothing personal against you as a person. It could be people don't know you're there. For me, it was really confusing for people because they're like, you're only open when? What is this? So it took people a really long time to kind of get the hang of what it, exactly I was trying to do here. There were times that I took it very personal, like, gosh, nobody likes my ideas. And I created this stuff that nobody thinks is they want to buy. So I think you're, you can be tough on yourself. But I think just realizing, no, reassess it. And what am I not doing that I could be doing that lets people know I'm here? Tammy from Hatch Art House also tries to think back on mistakes as more of a learning experience to benefit from. Regret is one of those things where I, I try not to think, look at anything as a regret, mm -hmm. just more of a learning tool, basically. So I, it's really hard for me to think. I'm sure there is something that I wish, you know, seven years ago that I wish I, was, I had known or done differently. But I would give myself advice as an artist. Okay. And uh, to not be so hard on yourself and to just trust your instincts more. Mm -hmm. I had a really great teacher in college who was basically my mentor, and he gave me the confidence to be an artist, and he pushed me to enter a juried show. And I was like, no, I'm not good enough. And he was like, you are good enough. Uh, he was my watercolor teacher. And he's like, I really want you to do this. And this was, you know, outside of my my classes. And he's like, I just really think this would be good for you. And he told me which painting to enter. And I entered it. I, I entered the show and I won an award. And I was just like dumbfounded because I never in a million years thought that I was good enough as an artist. I wanted to just sell other people's work. And I wanted to be an artist, but I didn't think I was good enough and I think a lot of artists struggle with that but it is it's great I wish I could take every single person that submits their work into the shop but you know I this just can't happen so I think I would just tell myself to have a little more conf a little bit more confidence mm -hmm. and to just go for it and be an artist since Mother Fools has been around the longest, John had some pretty good insight to the things that he learned. I think the main thing is just to do due diligence. I think I would get really excited, especially in the early days, emotionally about an idea. And then I would, I would let that supersede my logic brain. An example, I've never talked publicly about that <laughs> before. <laughs> okay. But one of the most humiliating events, and it'll seem small, but it was really humiliating to me. It was during the first days of Mother Fool, the first months, and a salesperson came in, and he was putting together a map of Willie Street, and it's going to show the local businesses, and for a certain amount of money, you can get your business more prominently featured. Hmm. I thought it was a great idea. What I didn't do is I didn't ask him specific questions. You know, what is it printed on? How big is it? You know, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Instead, I just got, I got into the idea, I agreed with it, signed the thing, and then a couple weeks later, he delivered it. And I realized it was a product I was embarrassed about. It was really big and laminated, and it smelled really toxic. You know, it's like, I'm not going to give this to anyone. It feels dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think I spent a hundred bucks or something, and okay. it just sat in the back room for the longest time, and it was it was my shame. You know, I just, I just <laughs> like, but it really taught me you've got to really be explicit about the details of things. You know, in that case, I just thought I knew. I was picturing this little fold out that everyone's going to have on their dresser at home or whatever, right. or they're going to tack it on a bulletin board. Yeah. No, it's this big, ugly thing. You couldn't even get flat because it was so curved, <laughs> you know, so you couldn't hang it. It's like, ugh. It sounds like he caught you at the right time. Like yeah. it was, you were a green new business owner. Exactly. And I bet if you looked at it, 
I bet Willie Street Co-op wasn't on it. I bet none of the big businesses. It was probably all the brand new naive mm. business owners. You know, so Aww. things like that. You know, so and I think in the early days of internet, we made mistakes about buying internet ads and things. Luckily, they were pretty cheap. Probably of very little value, but that's fine. You just kind of live and figure it out. I often say now. I'm really grateful that we started in the mid 90s when money was more plentiful and there was just a lot more ability to make mistakes that wouldn't be fatal. You know, I think now some of the mistakes, not the hundred dollar maps, but some of the mistakes that I was able to make in 1995 and six would actually put us out of business now. On our first anniversary, we were going to do this promotion. Stephanie and I figured this out. We made posters, put them all over town come in and celebrate one year in business with a free cup of coffee. Boy, people are gonna love it. It was one of the worst days of our life. How so? Why can't I get a mocha? Oh, Does this apply to tea? I don't drink coffee, can I just have a cookie? People were hostile to us all day, and no, and we hadn't really dealt with hostility ever in this business right. until then. And it's, it's like, okay, don't give anything away for free. Oh, that's too bad. Because I get, I get what happened, and at the same time, it's just like you were just trying to show appreciation, and then it made you just look like a jerk. I mean, to us, that was success. We were, we made it a year. Oh, so, and then, yeah, you just kind of learn things, and it's just like Stephanie. It's just like a general concept is what could we do to bring in more business. And a lot of times they go to let's let's make coupons. But my experience with coupons is it's a one-time deal. You don't get a regular customer out of it because right. people who like coupons. Get the coupon for the other one next week. Yeah, don't go after price-conscious customers. Go after ones that are interested in the experience, the culture, and the product. One thing I do now that took a long time, which I would have loved to have started with, is to only look at the averages. Don't look at day-to-day. Huh. You know, it's, it's painful. There's no, and it doesn't serve a purpose. Any particular snapshot is useless. You know, if we have a terrible day... In the old days, that could be a, a night of insomnia in all different ways that it manifested. But now I'm calmer. It's just like, yeah, that was a bad day, but we have to look at the weekly or the monthly average. It's all in a bigger picture. Hmm. Yeah, I think that would be one thing for sure. Okay. I think the other thing that was a humongous eye-opener is buying this business, I really felt that my staff were going to be my friends. And... We'd hang out and there'd be parties, but really quickly that didn't happen. Even though at that time they were all my age, you know that's an interesting part too. As I get older, my staff pretty much stay the same age. We have some long-term people who are aging, but mainly early to mid twenties. So that was really hard for me at first, but now I just have a more complete image. It's like no one really wants to party with their boss, even <laughs> even if he is cool or whatever. You know, another aspect of the social part that I wish I could have known is. It really affected a lot of my existing friendships. I found that, you know, I was so focused on new business and trying to figure out the puzzle of how you make it function that I gravitated in social events towards other business owners, you know, because we had more to talk about. And I found uh, some of my other friends just dissatisfying to spend time with. They couldn't relate to what I was thinking about. I couldn't relate to their stress of, oh, I have to work this weekend. Because yeah, I had to work every day, you know, mm-hmm. forever, right. basically. Yes, yeah, so it's just kind of, that was an interesting part, too. So I guess I would tell my former self, hold on, there's going to be some social changes in your life. And it's okay, it's just change. Kyle from Pieces Unimagined says there's a mistake that he keeps making. A mistake that I'm probably even currently making is not watching the nickels and dimes. You know, you're just busy and you're just like, do it, get it done, do it, get it done. That orders this, get it done. You need to watch yeah. um, without micromanaging, but you know what, you, things can get away from you. I'm saying that watch the nickels and dimes when it seems like the nickels and dimes don't matter because that's my that's the mistake that I made. Mm. It's like, hey, the sales are just, hey, it's, everything's just coming up roses. You just make things happen. And that would be a mistake that I made. Okay. And be like, yep, yep, I should have been paying more attention to what the outgo was and is there a profit margin enough to pay for the rent in your employees yeah. and everything else. Biggest mistakes I have made and I've made them probably three or four times now in the course of two years is I've let the 
customers slash sellers dictate what I would curate. And it happens without my knowledge. I'm kind of like, oh, there's a buying opportunity. Oh, there's a buying opportunity. Oh, that thing just came in. And yeah, I think we can sell it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Then your store loses its soul and you're no longer curating. Other people are curating for you. You're populating. Yep. It's awful. It's awful. I fell into the trap four times, and it, whenever it happens, it happens in waves. Everybody's like, hey, I got this, I got this. And you're mm. like, yeah, it makes it easy. I don't even have to go out and buy anything. And then you got a hodgepodge, and it, your store loses a soul. And items like this beautiful table loses context because you've got too much other stuff going on that you never, ever envisioned having. Yeah. No, that's so that would be simple. number one mistake, yeah. And we have to walk through this from time to time and say, useful, beautiful, no, get that shit out of here. <laughs> that, is, that is awful. Yeah. And so that helps guide that. And I just have to remember that at the front door when people are offering things to sell. Mia from Stone Fence has a good thing that she needs to learn to be more conscious of. One mistake that I keep making, actually, and I'm like, Bobby, well, why do I do this? is I have a tendency to give too much to donations and charities, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, what happened to July? I'm like, oh, I gave too much away. So I have a bad habit of doing that. How horrible for you being a good person. <laughs> I know. But I, and I love, that's your, that's your <laughs> I love it because they're all, you know, they're all local charities, and I'm like, right. oh, this is, I, I have trouble saying no. I would tell myself to keep an eye on my cash flow better because, again, it goes back to not just the donations, but... I just will be like, ooh, this is neat. I'm going to get this and this and this. And it's really just a matter of me not thinking. I just am too, I don't know, not spontaneous, but I just don't think things through always, which is not good when you have a business. You really need to do that. So I'll be riding along, and I'll be fine, and I'll follow the rules, and then all of a sudden I won't, and then I'll realize I've done that again. So if I could go back, I would really try to make myself stick to that. And this occurred to me while you were saying that, too. Mm-hmm. How did you, when you got the loan uh, and were setting up the place not once but twice, mm-hmm. how did you factor in the amount of the cost for fixing the places? We really, I mean, you can do a lot of fixing up with very little money. None of it was structural. It was just, most of it's elbow grease in your own time. Okay. Paint, a little bit of construction, but most of it's your time. So. Did you do the employee friends with beer thing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Lots of that. Lots of that. Demetrius and Micah from Yellow Rose Gallery are at the mercy of the mistakes that were pre-existing since they weren't around when the Yellow Rose Gallery began. There's a lot of uh, lessons to learn from the events that we've hosted. Uh, we've learned yeah. how, you know, some things aren't as, fa- as I don't effective as others. About, I don't want to speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's you understandable. Know. People are different. Artists yeah. are unique people. And yes. so it's not going to be the same thing one from the other. It's the same with music and the same with yeah. writers, the same with... Even customers, mm-hmm. not to call them customers, some people, you know, basically people who come to the events, mm-hmm. you don't know what you're going to get. And that's relevant anywhere. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And we'll continue to try new ways to promote events. Mm-hmm. Uh, some are a lot more effective than others. We will try to theme events in different ways. We've noticed that events during some seasons get a lot less people than in other seasons. The colder weather usually prevents people from coming to the events okay. uh, as easily as warmer weather. So uh, you guys don't fall victim to the students going away for the summer? No. Oh, okay. Not that I've noticed anyways. What What are some of the better ways that you found, or the more successful ways you found to prov- uh, promote yourself? Sharing the events on Facebook, actually. Okay, um, as simple as that. It's yeah, and we can we can measure it. Yeah, we can measure a, a percentage of the invite sent based on turnout. So we can indicate like, oh, we can fairly pretty much guarantee that we'll hit our target if we just share it X number of times. You're saying following up and like going, hey, this event or adding yeah. something new to it, and like having the artist share, and not just like on their walls, but like actually invite their friends. We can get like a thousand invites, right? Mm-hmm. That that guarantees about a hundred people. Yes, like the math is always funny there, but it's I, about it's about ten percent, yeah. maybe a little mm-hmm. less. We've also used flyers. Uh, it's a lot harder to measure, you know, response and that sort of thing. We've also released press releases to newspapers. Mm-hmm. Um, again, kind of difficult to gauge 
um, whether people show up just for that reason. I think a lot of our audience is on account of the location. They might just be walking by or there might be something going on. Um, at the Capitol and that sort of thing. So there's lots of lessons learned. So you were talking about putting up flyers. Uh, do you just put them up randomly or do you have specific places that work for you? I mean, I know you said it's hard to gauge, but some people must say, oh, and I saw the flyer here, you know, and you're like, oh, well, then we'll continue to put that up there. I hope someone has said that I saw a flyer somewhere. <laughs> um, I personally haven't heard it, but we would produce a, a certain number of flyers and then distribute them to the artists and the artists would distribute within their community. So here's a little tip I'd like to show you. If you're familiar with the Facebook audience insights that you can have for a group. So if you yep. go, okay, the insights, mm -hmm. you can choose a custom audience and choose people that like your page. And you look at that and then in there you click on the likes tab and you look and see all of the pages that people like. You can set it up to only look at the ones in Madison. And you look at all the stores that are there and that's where you can hang up your flyers because the people who like your page like those stores and they go to them. You put out your handbills or your flyers at those stores. People that go to those stores that are like them in the real world will see the flyers. That's really so, smart. Yeah, so I just wanted to share that information with you and see if you couldn't give it a try. Because I believe in the flyering thing. I do believe in accidentally hearing about things. Just a little more power to you. And I wanted to give back. One thing that happened early on in the interview process took me a little by surprise. Back in the first episode, when I was asking the question, what made you decide to do this? What motivated you? Demetrius from Yellow Rose Gallery wanted to know the same thing about me. And off the top of my head, I just said this one what made can i ask you a question yeah you can please do <laughs> <laughs> what motivates you to do your job basically i was the story was as i started out that i was going to do um i was going to be an animator i was going to make cartoons for a living and then uh i was going to go to college for that so we're talking all the way back in high school mm -hmm. and uh i ended up uh having a baby and dropped out of school and then Lots of stuff happened, stupid 20s, basically. Won't go into all that. <laughs> but that kind of fell to the wayside. And the program, the Flash, and, uh, came out, and I found out you could make animation very cheaply on the computer. So I taught myself how to do it, nice. made some cartoons with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started making art again, but that's not what happened was then I was like, well, how do you get this online? Now, this was before YouTube was around. So we're talking like a million years ago, internet wise. <laughs> So meaning before 2005. So I had to build a website for it. So I built a website, taught myself how to do that. And then other people wanted me to build websites. And then all of a sudden I got a job building websites. That's what I started doing. I became fascinated with it. Tons of years went by. And then about a year or so ago, I got a new job. Most I've ever made doing it. I'm sitting in a four by eight cubicle going, how the hell did I end up here? Right. Why am I doing this? I wanted to find time to do more artwork, and then I realized I don't know any of those people that used to do that anymore. Years had passed. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to meet new people that do it, find out how, and then maybe even share some of what I learned on the technical side because I know a lot of people talk about how they don't know how to promote themselves online or make websites or what they should do. So I did it the way I know how, and uh, the way I did the first season was I created an ad on Facebook for artists in Madison, and basically said, I want to talk to you. Do you want to be on a podcast? So I wanted to talk to anyone. And I just, anyone who signed up, I talked to them. And that was what you're hearing now on the show. So I wanted to talk to people that do participate in it. So that's, that's, that's what motivated me. Basically, I realized I took a break. And I'm like, why did I take a break? <laughs> <laughs> Listening back to it, I wasn't aware how far back my motivation to do this went. I'm kind of upset that I let it get away from me for so long. But I'm learning that you can change the way life is at any time, big or small. It's been almost a year since I began this whole journey and things are really different, hopeful. And I'm enjoying it quite a lot, so thank you all for that. But I'm not done yet. The season may be over, but I've already started scheduling more Madison artists to talk to for season three, which is coming soon. This will include artists, filmmakers, writers, crafters, and more. So if you haven't already, sign up for the email list and get more information at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. You can also find the show on Apple Podcasts and Google Play and YouTube. So until next season, so long. Mm -hmm.